Hi, this is Sal, and I'm here with Jeffrey Rosen, who's the head of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. And in the first video, we did an overview of, article, of the entire Article 2 of the Constitution, which covers the powers of the presidency. And now we're going to jump in a little bit deeper. And, you know, uh, Jeffrey, one of the things that surprises me about Article 2 is for a job as important as the president, it's, it's, it's an art, off, awfully short amount of text. It is. Uh, article 1, defining the powers of Congress, is much longer the framers were much more concerned about tyranny in Congress than tyranny in the executive. And because there is uh, so much wiggle room in Article Two, presidential practice has been really important. And obviously the most important president in establishing that practice was our first president, George Washington. And this is this idea that because it was short, it, it left out a lot of what a president maybe could do or could not do. And that's why our first president, our first president the precedent that he set was really important for, for how people perceive the, the powers of, of the president. Yes, he was. it's a nice uh, hominin. He was both the president and set this important precedent. And because the framers knew that Washington was going to be the first president, he takes office in 1789, right when the Constitution is ratified. They trusted him to establish these precedents, which have been followed to this day. And just a little bit of historical context. The 1776 is the official founding of the country, the Declaration of Independence, the official start of the Revolutionary War, uh, although obviously you have skirmishes before that. Uh, then you, we have the Articles of Confederation that get ratified in 1781. It was deemed that it was too weak of a, of a, of a essentially of a confederation. And then our Constitution gets ratified 1789, uh, same year that Washington takes office as our first president. Exactly right. And as, uh, as soon as he takes office, Washington faces this dilemma that's not answered by the Constitution. And that's, does he recognize the French Revolution, who have just killed and guillotined uh, Louis XIV? So Washington has these three choices. He can stand by the monarchy and condemn the revolution. He can recognize the French revolutionaries as the rightful government, or he can say, you know, it's not my choice and all of our former treaties are void. He consults his cabinet, decides to recognize the revolutionaries, and that establishes the precedent that presidents now have unilateral power to recognize or derecognize foreign governments. And, and that's interesting because when we're looking at Section 2, which at least talks something about treaties, it says that the president can make treaties. I'll underline, I'll underline this. It, the president can make treaties provided two-thirds of the senators pre present concur. It talks about uh, ambassadors, but it doesn't talk about the recognition of of foreign countries. And as you point out, the French Revolution, you know, things start in 1789. As you get into the early 90s, the revolution continues. And Washington says, well, do we, do we recognize uh, the government of Louis XVI that helped America during the French Revolution? Or do we recognize the revolutionaries who seem to have a lot more in common with us in terms of uh, their principles around uh, governments, at least the stated ones? Uh, and he decides that, well, it's not written in the Constitution here, but I'm as president, I, I can make that decision to recognize uh, the revolutionaries. Absolutely. And uh, that leads to another series of important questions, which you just flagged. Who exactly gets to negotiate the treaties? And Washington has, soon after the French Revolutionary recognition, he wants to negotiate a treaty with Britain. It's called the Jay Treaty. So he secretly sends Governor Morris, who's the framer who's most responsible for drafting the preamble to the Constitution, as an unofficial emissary or negotiator to Britain. And they negotiate the treaty. And then Washington uh, designates John Jay as the envoy. Uh, the Senate doesn't endorse the diplomatic mission. Jay is getting his order straight from Washington. After the deal is reached, then Congress, after the fact, approves of Washington's diplomatic entrepreneurship. So this establishes the really important precedent that the president can send emissaries to negotiate treaties which are approved by Congress after the fact. And that precedent is seized on by President Thomas Jefferson, who negotiated for the really important purchase of the Louisiana territory on the spot without congressional approval and gets Senate approval after the fact. Famously negotiated with Napoleon Bonaparte because he frankly it was, his navy had been destroyed at Trafalgar, so he was in no position to protect something halfway across the world. <laughs> and, and it, you know, this drove Jefferson's critics crazy because Jefferson is this big proponent uh, before he becomes president of limited presidential authority. And he becomes president and he seems to expand it by seizing on this treaty negotiation power that isn't explicitly in the Constitution and uh, hugely increases the landmass of the United States. 
And the importance of these precedents, just to go back to section two, it does say uh, he shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties provided two thirds of the senators present concur. And your, your point is, is that the way it's written in section two, it's not clear whether you need the advice and consent beforehand or whether they just kind of approve after the fact. And Washington, uh, and his term was from 1789 until 1797, uh, he assumed that, no, I, I should be able to go and very nimbly uh, negotiate these things without having to involve the entire Senate. And once it's negotiated, I need to go to them and get them to approve it. And Jefferson, who was in, in power from 1801 to 1809, uh, kind of further reinforced that precedent. Said, hey, I'm just going to negotiate this thing and then get it approved. That's exactly right. And that allows Jefferson, when he gets approval for the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, to get the Senate to approve the treaty and to persuade the House to finance the legal structure for the new territory. He probably couldn't have done that if he hadn't worked out the negotiating details in advance. And another element uh, that the second paragraph here of Section 2 talks about is, you know, with the advice and consent of the Senate. This, this is talked about a lot. And the Constitution tries to set up the Senate as, as where uh, the president goes to, you know, uh, test his ideas, get some uh, thinking. Uh, but Washington also decides that, well, it's not that efficient to talking to all these elected officials. Maybe I'll set my own uh, body that I talk to more frequently. That's exactly right. Uh, as we talked about before, Section 3 of the Constitution seems to say that the president can consult c Congress for advice in all sorts of situations. He can convene both houses or uh, he can adjourn them and so forth. But Washington established this precedent of using a cabinet, and that's a term that doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. Uh, despite uh, the part of the Constitution that also allows the president to seek the opinions of uh, the, the various officers, Washington informally s sought his uh, cabinet's advice. And today, although the cabinet meets less frequently than it did before, the presidential cabinet or cabinet meetings is established as a precedent in the executive branch. Yeah. And then the, the last piece that, uh, you know, we this this section two also talks about the ability of the president to make appointments, anything from uh, ambassadors, other public ministers, consuls, judges, Supreme Court and other officers in the United States. And it also talks about uh, inferior officers, which are more junior officers, um, that some of the presidents can do that without uh, getting approved by uh, Congress. Uh, th this is also up for some interpretation, and, and Washington's precedent is important there as well. It is. Uh, Washington was very frustrated by the Senate and uh, basically decided to cut it out and not to seek advice and consent in person. One account says that when he left the Senate chamber, he said he'd be damned if they ever went there again. He didn't seek the <laughs> Senate's uh, written advice before making big decisions like treaty negotiations, and he just preferred to consult uh, the cabinet. And the, that cabinet had huge and important disagreements. Again, we know from the musical Hamilton, uh, Hamilton and Jefferson d disagree about the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States. They both give their opinions. Washington listens to both, and he sides with Hamilton over Jefferson and decides to bless the constitutionality of the bank. He got that from his cabinet and not from Congress. And then finally, in this appointment, you know, to what degree can the president uh, unilaterally uh, take people out of their jobs, fire people? That is also left to interpretation. That's right. Washington established the ability for a president unilaterally to fire executive officers or executive department heads since the Senate textually has the power to hire department heads, you could have read Article 2 to allow it to have a mirror role in firing them as well. But the Supreme Court blessed this idea that the president can dismiss uh, people on his own. There was an important case called Myers against the United States, which said that the vesting clause, which we talked about earlier, gave the president both of the authority to execute the law and to remove executive officials. But there are other cases, like the Humphreys executor case from 1935, which said that Congress could limit the president's ability to remove certain commissioners. But the broad precedent that Washington establishes is that the president's unitary authority allows him alone to fire executive branch officials. Well, fascinating. Well, well thanks so much, Jeffrey. This is, this is super valuable. Thanks. Uh, great to talk.